All right, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Philippians chapter 3 today. We're going to continue our series on the joy of the Lord. You know, that song we just did was perfect for what we're talking about. I got Jesus, how could I want more? Because it's in jo- we find joy in and through our relationship with Christ Jesus. Years ago, Robert Fulgham wrote an essay that some of you probably never heard, but many of you probably have. It was simply stated, most of what I really need to know about life, I learned in kindergarten. How many of you have ever heard about this? He, he writes that true wisdom isn't found in the grad school, on the grad school mountain, but in the sandbox in the nursery school. And he goes on to share these things. He says, we learn to share, in the sandbox you learn to share everything. You learn to play fair. You learn not to hit. You learn to put things back where you found them. In kindergarten you learn to clean up your own mess. You learn don't take things that aren't yours. You learn to say sorry when you hurt someone. You learn to wash your hands before you eat. You learn how to take a nap, and that a nap is a good thing. Isn't that a good amen there? And then, of course, you learn to flush. Um, He says, when you go into the world, watch for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. You know, as I read that, I thought to say, you know what, that's not bad. That's actually pretty good advice. There's some good stuff, some things you can take. Because the truth is, much of what we learn in life, our values, our ethics, our, our sense of right and wrong, uh, our, our, our whole life to a great extent is learned when we're young. But there's something that's not learned when you're young. And that is how to live joyfully content in the things of your life. See, if we're being honest, this is a struggle for many people, especially in an American culture. See, in a dog-eat-dog, type-A-driven culture, the pursuit of true God-satisfying joy is often exchanged for human achievement, human ambition, and human accolades. We think that by some temporary success, we're going to find happiness. And yet the truth is, it doesn't take long to look at story after story after story after story of people who obtain all kinds of accolades and ambition. They, they make a way for themselves that calls people to go, oh man, I wish I was like them, only to find them in the, in, in, in the toilet because they do not find what they're looking for and that's something to satisfy, them, satisfy their soul. We see it over and over and over. Well, we've been in, a, in the study of, uh, in the book of Philippians studying how to discover joy. In fact, the actual word that's used throughout the book is the word rejoice, which means to return to the source of your joy. And the source of our joy as followers of Christ is just like that song just said. It's Jesus. Jesus is what really gives us joy and following him. In fact, what he has done throughout, what Paul has done throughout this book is he has said there's really really five keys to having joy in your life. And the first is you have to remember who you are in Christ. That's what he prays for the Philippians in chapter one. He says, it's so critical you remember who you are because of what he did. Because Jesus changed everything when we received him as our savior. He changed our eternity. He put the Holy Spirit inside of us. He gave us new life, new focus, new purpose. And because of that, that's the beginning place of joy. But then he also says in chapter one, he says a second key to having joy is remaining faithful to the gospel. In in every aspect of your life, it's making him first. It's it's allowing God to direct your steps in the things that make not just an earthly difference, but an eternal difference. And so he says, keep as your focus the gospel. The third thing he did, and we talked about this last week, is he encourages us to rethink our attitude. He says, your attitude ought to be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, what was Jesus' attitude? The Bible says that even though he was in the place, he he was the triune God in heaven, that he stepped out of heaven and into flesh and became a servant who died on the cross to atone for our sins. He was selfless. He was sacrificial. And, And he says, if you want to have joy in life, you've got to have the same attitude. You can't live for yourself. You got to live for something greater than yourself. You got to live just for the things of God, the people of God, and for the gospel. Well, today he says the fourth thing that we need to do is we need to reconsider what's really important in life. And Paul's going to do something unique. He's going to throw in his own story. 
He's going to use himself as the example here of what he has learned throughout his life. Now, the word reconsider means to reevaluate. It means to reassess. It means to refocus. Now, it means to go back and look at something again and again and, if necessary, again and again and again so that you understand what's really at stake, so that you understand what you're really a part of, what you're really, what you're really pursuing. Now, as I said earlier, Paul is, is going to share from his own previous story. If you remember, Paul was not a good guy before he encountered Jesus. In fact, even though he was a Pharisee, he was a zealot. He was a man who, who was determined that he was going to extinguish Christianity. He was in opposition to Christ, and he was a persecutor of Christianity. In fact, the Bible says that, that or the, the history says, and the Bible says that he was literally holding the cloaks of the men and women who were stoning Stephen when Stephen stood up to testify of the love of God in Jesus Christ. But then something happened to him. On his way to Damascus, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9, tells us his story. That here he is on on this road, and all of a sudden he has a, a close encounter with God. And in that encounter, God changed his life. He he turned him inside out and right side up. And he says, I want you to see life differently now. And so Paul's, literally the scales came off his eyes and he started to see life as God intended. He saw his purpose. He saw meaning. And in that process, he comes to us and says, let me tell you what I learned about what's really important. Let me tell you what's, what's worth living in your life. And so he gives us three principles in this text from chapter three to chapter four, he gives us three principles. He says, these are the things that you must do if you want joy. If you don't do these things, joy is going to be stolen away from you. You'll never find it. So the first thing he says is watch out. He says, watch out for those who would try to steal your joy. Reconsider who the real joy stealers are. And so he starts in verse two. He says, watch out for the dogs, those evildoers, the mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, and there he's talking about the circumcision of the heart, those who are saved, who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He says, you know what? You guys may think that you're good. You may think that you're special, but you have nothing on me. And then he goes on to describe who he was. He says, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. He says, listen, if there was anybody who could stand up and say, look at how good I am. If there's anybody who could stand up and say, if you think by, he- by earthly standards you can earn access to God, let me show you, I'm the person that could really earn access to God if it were possible. If it were possible. He says, but you need to watch out. You need to watch out not just from those without. You need to watch out from your own desires within. And he, and he explains to them, here's what you need to do. Now, the word watch out means to be, be on alert, be vigilant. Parents, you'll understand this. It means literally to have eyes in the back of your head. (laughs) You can't miss anything. You've got to be constantly on your guard. And what he says you need to be on guard of is anyone or anything that might try to lead you astray, that might try to pull you away from the truth. See, joy is found in the truth. It's not found in lies. And yet we know that there's an enemy out there who's trying to pull us astray. Now, in particular, in this text, in this, in this part of the scripture, Paul was dealing with a group of people known as Judaizers. Who were the Judaizers? Judaizers were people who professed to know Jesus and to follow Jesus as their Savior. But the truth is, they really weren't followers of Jesus. They were not putting their faith in the cross. Instead, they were putting their faith in following the rules of Judaism. They basically took Judaism and then intermingled it with Christian thought, came to the church and started leading people away saying, listen, if you're good, if you follow these rules, if you get circumcised, if you do all these Jewish acts, then God will give you his favor. Now, here's a problem with that. 
That's not the way it works. That is not the way it works. And in fact, it's just the opposite. It's not obeying the law. It's not getting circumcised. It's not being moral. It's not showing religious compliance that gets you favor with God. And yet that's what they were peddling. In fact, what they were doing was saying this, your works are more important than the cross. Now you go, well, what's wrong with that? Well, there's a lot wrong with that. In fact, let me just kind of lay it out for you very simple. If you could get to heaven by being good, if going to church gained access, if you had like this little checklist, this little grading system, and it says, I went to church, I prayed, I read my Bible, I gave a tithe, I went on a mission trip. If you start checking all these things off, and then when you get to heaven, you go, God, here's my report card. He would say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because here's the reason. If being good, if doing religious acts could gain access to to heaven, could gain God's forgiveness, then why in the world did Jesus die on a cross? That was the most unnecessary thing in all of human history. For the Son of God to humble himself and become a servant, just like, like we talked about last week in Philippians 2. He humbled himself. He literally incarcerated himself in human flesh so that he could die on a cross to atone for your sin and my sin. If that's not necessary for salvation, it is the, it is the dumbest thing in all of eternity. But the fact of the matter is, it's not. It's the only mechanism. It's the only way. It's the only solution. It's the only healing agent for the problem of sin. There is no other way. And so it's not through our good works. It's not through our our religious antics. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. And yet the truth is, all across Christianity today, there are denominations, there are people who are espousing that your works are essential to your salvation. In fact, I grew up in such a denomination. I was taught good boys went to heaven, bad boys went to hell. I was taught if I did enough good things, I literally was going to be accepted by God. And let me tell you what good news it was when I heard that I can't save myself, that my good works have nothing to do with this. And yet if you look at every religion and every cult in this world, in fact, let me, let me make it really simple. Do you want to know the difference between truth and untruth? Do you want to know which faith to put your energy into, to put, your, to, to, to put your beliefs in? Every cult, every cult, every other religion other than Christianity, in some way, some shape, some form, teaches that man's effort, that man's conduct, that man's compliance to its religious beliefs is what gets them access to God. Only Christianity says, no, it doesn't. Only Christianity says, it's not what you can do, it's what God did for you. In fact, here's what the Bible says. Isaiah speaking says, all of our garments are filthy rags. They're sin tainted garments. So, so the very best I had to offer, if, I, if, if this was all that I had to offer to God, and I would say, God, here, this is what gives me access to God. He would open it up and said, it's all tainted. It's all been infected with sin. And Psalm 5, 4 says, our God takes no pleasure in wickedness, no evil dwells in him. So he could not accept it. A holy, righteous God cannot accept my good, well-intended, tainted deeds because they're infected with sin. What that means is that no matter how good, no matter how noble my best efforts might be, God can't accept them. In fact, let me tell you what what Paul said to the Romans to really underscore this thought. Romans chapter 3, verse 9, he says this, what shall we conclude? Do we have any advantage, talking about our relationship with God? Not at all. In fact, that's an emphatic word there. No, no, no. I have no advantage. And he goes on to explain, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles, you could put in there barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free if you want. Jews and Gentiles, in other words, everyone alike 
are under the power of sin. Every one of us, every one of us, from every tribe, every nation, is under the power, the punishment of sin. And then he says, as is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who seeks after God. All of us have turned away. Together, we have become worthless. Look what he says. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their, fi- their, their, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and mercy mark their ways. The, and the way of peace they do not know. And then this last phrase. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Do you know who he's talking about? Tell you what, everybody pick up, p- point your finger. I want you to point to the person to your right or to the left and say, he's talking about you. Now take that same finger and say, he's talking about me. He's talking about all of us. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And every one of us are under the curse. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is separation from this God who loves us, but our sin separates us from here, from him. And so Paul is here is teaching, he's illustrating that he says, from my own story, I was putting all my hope, all my trust in my Judaism. I was putting all my hope and all my trust in my behavior, in my efforts, in my works. And then when I met Christ, I realized That was not going to save me. That was not going to rescue me. The only thing that was going to rescue me was the love of God found in Christ Jesus at the cross. That's what he says. And so he's teaching us, watch out. Watch out for anyone. I don't care how popular they are. I don't care how many books they've written. I don't care how many tours they've made. I don't care how nice a person they are. Be on your guard, do not ever buy in to anyone that's going to teach you that you can gain access to God through your own humanity, good works. You can gain access to God to anything other than the cross. The Bible says that in the last days, there will be people who will tickle your ears. They will tell you what you want to hear instead of what you need to hear. And folks, that day has come. It's come. We hear it all the time. You know, a couple of years ago, I was in that passage of Scripture where Jesus, where, where, where Jesus is speaking. He says, broad is the road that leads to, destru- to destruction, and narrow is the road that leads to life. And as I was thinking about that, I, I, I was like, God, what are you really trying to help us to understand? Broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to life. And I had this mental picture of a road and, and, and this road is the road to liberty. It's the road to freedom. It's the road to life. But on one side, you have a ditch, and on the other side, you have a ditch. And what hit me in that process is that it doesn't matter whether Satan gets you into the ditch of legalism or whether he gets you into the ditch of liberalism. He just doesn't want you on the road to liberty. And so he'll do anything. He'll get you so tied up in knots, so, so, so abiding to the rules of religion that you'll miss God. But he'll also get you to the opposite extreme, that you're like the prodigal son. You'll get so far of God and so full of yourself that you won't care about God. He doesn't care if he gets you in the ditch on the right or the ditch on the left. He just does not want you to walk on the road to liberty. And so Paul says, if you're going to have joy, if you're going to experience Jesus, you got to constantly be on your guard. You have to watch out. Second thing he says is you got to give up. He says you got to reconsider what really brings joy, what really gives joy. Now watch what he says, because he transitions from this thought and really gets personal here. He says, but, what, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them trash, rubbish. In other words, all that he was putting his faith in, all of his good works, all of his stature, all of his influence, he says, I consider that trash that I may gain Christ and be found in him. 
not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus. The righteousness that comes back from God on the basis of faith. Now watch this. He says, what I really want is this. I want to know Christ. This word is gnosko. He doesn't just want to know about him. He wants to experience him. He, he, you know, how we have in our faith, we are, we are putting our faith in something we can't see. Paul says, I'm not content with that. I want to know it. I want to know it. I want to know it empirically. I want to see it. I want to taste it. I want to touch it. So I, I, want, I want not five, uh, five uh, just one sense of faith. I want six senses. I want all the five empirical senses and faith. I want to know Christ with every fiber of my being. He says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings to become like him in his death and somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead. This is one of the most prolific and important statements in all of Scripture. To know Christ, not just know about him, but to truly know him, to know his heart. See, I think what Jesus, I think what he's saying here, he's asking, asking a couple of questions. And these are important questions. I think what Paul is saying is, what is Jesus, what is joy really worth to you? What's its value? Is, is Jesus worth giving up your most valued earthly possession? Is Jesus worth giving up that pet sin that you think that nobody else knows about but God knows about? Is Jesus worth giving up your favorite hobby? Is Jesus get worth giving up a, 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 a week or a month to serve him? Is Jesus worth giving up your personal ambitions? Your personal aim? Is Jesus worth giving up your reputation, your integrity, if that's what's needed? That's what he's asking here. And let me tell you what he says. He says, unequivocally, without a doubt, absolutely it's worth it. That's what Paul says. I consider all things trash, all things rubbish. Everything I put my faith in, everything I'd worked for, it, meant, it means nothing that I might know Christ. Really knowing and really serving. He says, what he's saying is, if you really want soul-satisfying joy, you got to give up. You have to give up. See, if you, if you want to go up, you got to give up. And so he asks these questions. He says of the disciples, he says, whoever wants to be my disciples must do these things. In fact, if you remember the story in Luke chapter 9, Jesus is with the disciples. They, they've actually, they're actually at the, at the place of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was, was up in the mountains, and it was a, it was a shrine to all the false gods, literally they had, this, they had this big hole that they would take the sacrifices and throw them down in it. And you literally had idol row where you could, you could walk and you could choose what idol you wanted. They had Pan. They had all the different Roman gods, the different, different gods of the world. Literally, you could go and pick your, your, your house of idolatry. And as Jesus is standing there, the disciples have been up there. They're around the base of Mount Hebron. Uh, um, excuse me, Mount... Um, just went blank. Anyway, they're up on the mountain, and, and, and he says to them, you've been in the crowds today. Who do the crowds say that I am? Now, you have all the flavors of the month line up there, and Jesus looks at the disciples and says, who do you say that, who do the crowds say I am? Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. But who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. All these other gods, they're false gods. You are the one and only true God. And Jesus says, you're right, Peter. You are right. And then he says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciples, they must do three things. They must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Deny, take up, and follow. Deny, take up, and follow. Say that with me. Deny, take up, and follow. One more time. Deny, take up, and follow. 
they must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Look what he says after this, verse 24. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit or lose their very self? Now, let's get, let's get honest for a second. This smacks right in the face of our American Christianity. Good thing Jesus called us to be biblical Christians and not American Christians, huh? But it smacks right in the face. See, American Christianity says, oh, you don't have to deny yourself. And you don't have to take up any crosses. And, you know, when you want to, when it's convenient, when it's comfortable, that's when you can follow. I mean, you don't have to go to church. You don't have to be part of the family of God. You don't, you don't have to give yourself away. The American dream is you're to get it all. Huh. You know, I, I've gone through all the scriptures. I've yet to see any place that it says American Christianity is biblical Christianity. To deny means to give up or surrender your desires, your ambitions for his will and his way, for a divine cause greater than yourself. See, we must surrender our plans for his plans, our kingdom for his kingdom, our will for his will, our priorities for his priorities. And we're called to relinquish anything that would inhibit us from following him. Then he also says we're to take up. That phrase take up literally means to bear. It means to to grab. It, It means to carry. In this case he's saying our cross. Now we've talked about this before. He's not telling us that we are to carry the cross of Christ. We can't do that. All of us are sinful. He was sinless. That's what enabled him to carry the cross that provides salvation. But the cross he is referring to is any blessing, any challenge, any difficulty. But how we carry our cross is a direct reflection of what we believe about his cross. Do you understand what I'm talking about? See, if, if, if I have bad news come to me, if I lose my job, if I, if I get a sickness and I go off scoffing going, oh God, I, I, I hate God, I can't believe God did this to me. What is that going to cause other people to believe about my God? Is it going to cause them to believe that my God can, that my God is able, that my God is with me, that my God is sovereign? Or is it going to cause them to believe that my God is feeble, weak, and and really not necessary. See, how we carry our cross, whether it's a good cross we have to carry or a difficult cross we carry, how we carry our cross is a direct reflection on the cross that he carried for us. And so when we carry the cross that he's asked us to carry in a way that's God-honoring, in a way that trusts him and, and believes that God will be with us and not forsake us, it helps other people to see that the cross he carried is a cross that truly changes lives. So he says, we must not ourselves take up our cross and follow him. The word walk, it means to walk alongside. It means to, to walk in the footsteps. It's a word of alignment. It's, it's a word of, of focus. It's, it's a word of replication. And what Paul's really saying here is this. If you want joy, if you want soul-satisfying joy, then you've got to give up. You have to give up your brand of American Christianity. You have to take up a biblical model of fellowship. And in doing so, you will begin to live not for the things of this earth, but you will begin to live for the things of God. Can I be honest with you? That's one reason we do this right here. It's not just because people around the world need the Lord, which obviously they do. It's also an exercise to help us to never forget that we're a part of something greater than ourselves. It's a reminder that I have to give up something in order to give away that which is precious and that which gives joy. And I don't know if you've had this sensation, but there's joy in ministering Jesus to other people. There's joy. Then there's a third thing. We are called, number one, to watch out. Second, we're called to give up. And third, we're called to press on. This is a lengthy part of the scripture, but there's so much in it. I want to encourage you to go back and read all this passage. But here's what Paul says. 
not that I have already obtained all this, not that I've reached perfection or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In other words, God didn't just save me. He saved me for a purpose. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to strive for that purpose. He says, brother, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet, but one thing I do, I forget what is behind. Boy, I tell you what, would we not all be great if we could just forget some of the goofy stuff that's happened in our past? Can, can, I, can I let you in on a little secret? I mean, this is really important. I, won't, I, I may not say anything else as profound as what I'm getting ready to say right now, all right? You can't undo your past. Did you know that? You can't undo it. All you can do is put it behind you. All you can do is put it behind you. But there is something that happens, and it happened at the cross, that when you bring your past to the cross, it's amazing how God will sever all those talons, all those, all those, 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 those ropes that tether you to it. He can sever those, and you can walk away free from your past. Because anyone's in Christ, they are new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things become new. See, that's the beauty of the cross. The beauty of the cross, it does not hold you guilty. It frees you from your guilt. It sets you on a new path. It gives you new purpose. It gives you new hope. That's the reason there's joy, because we don't have to drag away, drag our past behind us everywhere we go. Did any of you ever see the movie The Mission? It was about, it was about this, this, this group of, of people that were uh, going to the new country, and, and there was this, this captain who he, he just could not get over his past. So what he did was he literally took a bag of rocks and tied them to himself. And everywhere he w- went as an act of penance, he drug, drug this bag of rocks everywhere he went. Can I tell you that I see people doing this all the time, dragging their past with them everywhere they go. Why? Why in the world do you want to drag your past around? when it can be forgiven and forgotten at the cross. I guess that's a whole other sermon. You got two sermons from one today, all right? Here's what he says. Brothers, I do not consider myself as having taken over yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ Jesus has called me heavenward. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. In other words, we should realize There's nothing more important than living for Jesus and putting the past behind you. And he says, and and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live what we have already attained. Join together in following my example. That's a call to be a church family. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. In other words, it's okay to look at another believer and say, they look like they're pursuing Jesus. I need to get beside them and allow them to have some influence in my life and help me learn how to follow Jesus too. You know what we call that today, don't you? Discipleship. It's life-to-life ministry. But he goes on to do this. He says, and just as you have us as a model, he says, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you even again with tears, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Do you know who he's talking about here? He's not talking about everybody out there. He's talking about people inside the church who are living as enemies of the cross. Oh, they come to church. They pray. They read the Bibles. They, they, they engage in life groups. They do all the things that make them look religious But it says they're enemies of the cross. And he goes on to describe them. And it's actually pretty terrifying what he describes here. He says their their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. In other words, they're only concerned about fulfilling fulfilling their appetite with the things of this world. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things instead of heavenly things. See, it's possible to be religious, to go to church, and yet... To not have a relationship with God because you are so in love with the world and you think the world is going to fulfill you, the world is going to satisfy you, that you will be religious but be lost to the grace and the joy of God. It's possible. 
But then he says this, but our citizenship is in heaven. There's that word we talked about the last two weeks. For we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. I don't know if you caught what just happened. He says we eagerly await. In other words, he's saying, I'm not living for what the world can give me. I'm living, setting my focus on the things of God, on the people of God, on the blessings of God. I, 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 I'm waiting so that when Jesus were to, were to return in this very second, I would be ready. I wouldn't be ashamed. You know, I got a question. If Jesus were to return right now, at this very second, would you go, woohoo, hallelujah, and you give a head start? We call that rapture practice, <laughs> all right? Or would you go, uh, hold on, God, I need to pray first because I know I'm not right with you, and I, there's just no way I can go to heaven in this kind of condition. I can't go to heaven with this kind of focus. Paul is saying, listen, live each moment, each second of every day in the expectation of Christ's return. He says, that's the key to pressing on. The key to pressing on is living each and every moment, expecting for Christ to return this very second. In fact, it's interesting, the word he uses here for press on, it means to be unwavering at full capacity. I love that. In other words, I am, I am all in and nothing's going to detour me. That the word is actually used of a, of a sprinter who is reaching for the finish line with all of his might. He's straining for, for the finish line. He's saying, give it all you have. Give it everything you have. Don't leave anything on the mat. Paul's saying, give Jesus all you have, the best of you, utterly surrendered, fixated on who he is and who he's called you to be. Now, that may sound like he's talking about works, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about surrender. He's talking about giving God everything that you have, that you're so deeply, in fact, one commentator said it this way. He's saying, live so deeply surrendered and under the influence of the Holy Spirit that you have no other focus or desire than to see God's will accomplished in and through your life. That's a statement. Live so deeply surrendered and under the influence of the Spirit that you have no other focus or desire than to see God's will accomplished in and through your life. Mm. When I was thinking about this passage and mulling over it, God put in my heart the story of the rich man who was trying to figure out what, would, what to do with all of his possessions. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus is speaking. He says, the ground of rich men yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I'll, I'll do this. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and, and I'll store my surplus grain. And he said, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. Do you, you remember what a fool is? A fool is someone who says in their heart, there is no God. A fool is also someone who says, oh, I believe in God, but they live as if God doesn't exist. He says, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. In other words, this very night, you're going to die. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how to be to whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. In other words, what does a prophet of man to gain the whole world but forfeit their very soul? So he says, press on. Live for the right things. Get your focus on Christ. Get your focus on his calling in your life and live after those things. Because if you don't, you will not experience the true satisfying joy that God has for you. 19th century theologian and philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, I think has a great description of this. He wrote an article or wrote a, a story about wild geese. And here's what he says. I think this story illustrates what Paul was trying to say to us. He says, with the season, wild geese came and went as their ancestors had done for centuries. One day, 
some of the geese on their annual trek landed in a farmer's barnyard where he adopted them and saw to it they had plenty of grain to eat. Life was easy, and the geese decided they had found a fine place to live out the rest of their days. But as time went by, the easy life took its toll. Soon the geese became fat and lazy, and their ambition to soar again in the high places waned. Nonetheless, when they heard the familiar honks of their friends high above passing by, the fat, lazy, now barnyard geese could only casually look up. Oh, occasionally one of them would have an old stirring to join his friends in the sky and soar again where the air was pure and sweet. But it was always to no avail. In fact, one day those stirrings were too strong for one of the geese to resist and it started its courageous run across the pasture, extended its wings to fly, became airborne for only a few feet, only to plop not too gracefully back to terra firma. Needless to say, before long, the call of the high places all but vanished and these now barnyard geese. So while the wild geese's friends would fly over, honking their call to a higher, higher, nobler life, the grounded geese soon paid little attention as they contentedly pecked away on the farmer's corn. For because of comfort, the desire to return to the freedom in the skies altogether disappeared. For although they were made for higher places, the soft life had ruined them and stolen their joy and their purpose for living. You know, I believe in the same way. If we're not vigilant, if we're not honest with ourselves, what will happen is the trappings of this world, the the comfort of the flesh and the wiles of of the devil will easily lead us down a road of religious contentedness. And we who were called to soar on wings like eagles, we who were called to a great adventure of faith known as the Great Commission, we who were called to have, to live in a joy that can bring satisfaction all the way to the core of our being, we'll settle for the comfort and convenience of American Christianity, sitting in our pews, but not being part of the work of God. Paul was one of those. So here's the hope. The hope is even though you may be in conditioned, you don't have to stay there. God will give you an encounter that can change your heart that can give you a new hope, a new purpose, a new focus. And it's what you do with that that determines the great adventure you'll live in this thing called the Christian life. I, for one, I've experienced, I've shared this many times, I lost Jesus at church. I don't ever want to lose him here again. I want to be a part of the great adventure. What about you? Father, thank you for the chance we've had to study your word. Thank you for the example of Paul. Thank you for the hope that we see in his life. Because Lord, the truth is it's so easy to be conditioned to be a fat, happy, lazy, sassy American Christian. It's so easy to do the nominal things to make us feel good about ourselves but never really step out in faith and trust you and allow you to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can ask or imagine. And so, Lord, I I just ask that today, as you've spoken to my own heart, Lord, I have to believe you're speaking to the hearts of the other men and women in this church and the lives of these teenagers. That, Lord, that we would want more than just American Christianity. That, Lord, we would want biblical Christianity. We would want to know you in the power of your resurrection, the fellowship of your suffering, so that we can be conformed to you. So, Lord, whatever you need to do this morning, whether we're sitting here and just need to bow our heads and and, and bow our hearts to you, or, Father, where we need to come to this altar and and as an act of faith kneel before you and, and say, Lord, here's my life. Father, whether it's joining this church or, Father, whether it's giving our lives to you for the very first time, Lord, you know every heart, you know every condition. And, Lord, only your spirit can penetrate But, Lord, we ask that just as you did with Paul, you'll do with us. That, Lord, you'll get past our religion and you'll get to the core of our relationship. And you'll do that in this very second. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? As we go into our invitation, 
I can tell you that, that as I told the first service, you know, it's not, it, it, it's, it's, not un, it's, it's not unlikely that whenever I preach, God convicts me, but there are times that when I preach, He convicts me more. <laughs> Today's one of those days. I, I wasn't preaching at you. I was preaching at myself. But God wants to do a great work in and through our lives. It requires we watch out. It requires that we give in. And it requires that we press on. One of the best ways you can start is by bending your knee and bowing your heart and saying, God, do something great in my life today. Respond as the Lord leads you this morning.